that we are here for, to honor you, to worship you, to adore you this morning. Father, we just pray that everything that we do and sing and say are those things pleasing in your sight. Father, we ask you now to inhabit this service with us, Father, just to take the honor and glory that we give you this morning. We pray this in your Son's name. Simon says. <laughs>
importance of maintaining your focus while you're driving. Yet it's when we're driving in adverse, under adverse conditions that our attention span seems to take on a whole different level of concentration. Case in point, say you're driving at night, it's pouring down rain, and to add to your dilemma, you're not familiar with the road that you're on. The signs along the road warn you of possible impending dangers ahead. And while you can slow down, there's no place that you can pull off the road safely. Yet, you can't even risk, or risk stopping for fear of causing an accident. Therefore, it's necessary for you to take every precaution possible to block out any and all distractions that may hinder you from maintaining your focus to avoid a potential life or death situation so that you may arrive safely at your intended destination. It's not an accident that the things of this world compete and fight for our attention each and every moment of our lives. We're told Satan knows our personal weaknesses and it's through these momentary worldly pleasures that he uses to divert our attention away from our original intended destination. It's in this way that we become spiritually blind and unable to focus on our eternal goals. It's at this point that it becomes a matter of life and death. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 6, that to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is, is life and peace. Therefore, to alter our path, it's essential that we cast aside the things of the world which are temporal and concentrate our full attention on Christ our Savior, who is unseen. This is our spiritual act of worship. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells us that the Lord's Supper is to be a holy and sacred time of remembrance, which is not to be taken lightly. For it was the Lord Jesus who instituted this memorial. Paul continues to tell us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given things, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way as he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's here at the Lord's table that we are called not only to actively participate in this memorial of remembrance, but to mindfully focus on the beautiful imagery of these sacred elements that we are intended to help us uh, envision Christ's body and blood. Paul warns us <clears throat> through, you know, to, uh, to partake of this communion without discerning the body of Christ would be to eat and drink judgment on ourselves. <coughs> Therefore, it is vitally important that each person examines their heart to assure their motives are pure and righteous, to freely partake of these, this communion without fear of punishment. May we then reciprocate the same love and compassion that the Christ has poured over our souls, dying to ourselves and living for him who died for us, for who we give ourselves to as a matter of life and death. And as Christ restores our spiritual vision of our eternal destination, let us with deep respect and awe humble ourselves, our hearts, our minds, so that they would reflect the honor and reverence of our Lord and Savior, proclaiming Jesus Christ's name until he returns again. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
We thank you for the bountiful lives you provide us, the ability to earn livings, to experience your creation each and every day. And now, bless these gifts as we give back a portion of those financial gifts. And let us remember that uh, we give 100% of our lives each and every day to you, Father, that we live through Christ. As you bless these gifts, that we may use them wisely in your church, locally and state, nationally, and around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. How did I 
know who it was. Because his lovely wife puts his picture on Facebook. <laughs> Had it not been CNN over 10 years, I might have been like, ooh, ooh, that's, you know, trying to come up with the name. But, but just the touch, the, the touch of things. And, and, you know, there's that old song. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer felt that it was hardly worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. He said, one dollar once, one dollar twice, one dollar, that's good, but that's price. And from the back of the crowd, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. He tightened up the strings and began to play. He says, he played out a melody pure and sweet, sweet as the angels would sing. And he laid it down and went back to his seat. And the auctioneer once again picked it up and said, what is my bid for this old violin? One thousand once. That's a good price for 2000 do I hear? The crowd all murmured, and one guy said, what made the difference? And the guy said it was the touch of the master's hand. I mean, every week I stand back there in communion time, and, and my focus is right here at the table. And when you're focused on the table, you can't help but notice that hand. That hand that has touched every one of our lives. The hand that has made a difference in us. The hand that has made us so that we will never be the same again. It was that touch of that hand that introduced me to you. Without that touch, I'm not preaching. I'm doing something else. Without that touch, I'm, I'm not in Florida. I'm a cold weather guy. I mean, without that touch, this isn't possible. But because of that touch, because of the plan, because of the pattern that God had, here we are. And you're not here by mistake today. God, God touched you and brought you here for a purpose, for a reason. I mean, you're here because of God. We sang these songs, not just to be singing songs, we sang them because of God. We came to worship Him. Far from what you might think, today was not about you. The only part of you that God wanted was you here loving Him. It's all about Him. And so we get touched by being here. We get touched by being reunited with friends. We get touched by just seeing familiar faces. You know, say, hey, gosh, Carl, it's good to have you back. I mean, you're gone three weeks, four weeks. I mean... We could have lost them. But now you got a pacemaker? Is it a defibrillator too? Keeps you going. So that he comes walking through the door this morning. It's like, hey, Carl. And it's like that with everybody. When, when you're away for a while, it's like, hey, how have you been? It's like we haven't lost any time. But I want you to look around, I want you to look around you. I want you to look at the chairs by you and figure out who's missing. Who's normally sitting back here? You're normally over here. But they stole your seats. They were visitors and didn't know. You know. But, but people sit in their place, but look around. Who's not here today and why aren't they here? Maybe they need your touch. Maybe the touch of, of, of a phone call. <coughs> Maybe it's a touch of dropping by their house. Maybe it's inviting them to dinner. Maybe it's something that, that reinvigorates them to know, hey, you're important to us. And, and we miss you when you're not there. You know, last week, this, this couple seats behind Gwen here were empty. You know, I said to Joel and Neil today, I said, man, we missed you last week. And, and it's true, we, we, we missed them. Because when they're not there, the family's not whole. <laughs> you know? and, and so we do those things. And so today we want to talk about touching. We want to talk about that touch that's so special. And we want to do that by going to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. For those visitors in here, we don't have Wi-Fi. You're on your mechanical thing, but you do that on your own. 
just got reminded because Phyllis pulled hers out. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. 1 through 4. It reads like this. When he came down to the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And so we start off by reading about a man who was to be ostracized, a man who was to be shunned. I mean, even sent to a island to get away from us because you have leprosy. Leprosy, a debilitating disease. But Jesus was asked a question. If you are willing, you can heal me. What was Jesus' reply? I am willing. Now the man had to ask. Why did he have to ask? He had a debilitating disease. He had a disease that was communicable. That, that he could pass on. I mean, when you read this story, the first question came to my mind is, what was he doing in that crowd with that disease? That's just how I think. I mean, why was he there? Why wasn't he already put off? I mean, it had to be obvious he had the disease. Story. You know? Um, there's, that, there's that song we sang as kids, Leprosy, All My Skin Is Falling Off of Me. My nose is where my mouth should be. I, you know those words. You ever, you ever sang that song? <laughs> See, I told you I was just that way. <laughs> um, and it sang to a Beatles too. I mean, my dad. No, gosh, your dad talked to that song. See, two minds, two great minds. <laughs> Anyways, we'll skip that. I could go on. But um, but you get the idea, leprosy was just a bad disease, and, and here it was in this crowd, and here's Jesus. And when he touched him, what? Immediately, it says, immediately he was clean. Now we're telling you this story because you need to be touched by the Master's hand. You need that healing touch. Your song goes like this, shackled by a heavy burden, neath the load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. What did that touch make this person whole of? Sin. 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 Anybody here have sin? I mean, it's, are you human? You've sinned. So, if we have sinned, we need this touch. We are shackled by a heavy burden, a burden that we cannot shed ourselves. I mean, do you have a sin in your life that you're, you've struggled with over and over and over and over throughout your life? I mean, it just constantly seems to be there. Have you ever really given it God. You see, you've, you've tried to tackle it. You can't. You've tried to take care of it. You can't. But He can. He'll touch you and make you whole. How does He touch you? I, I mean, again, my mind working. I walked outside my door today and God touched me with humidity. And being ready and my mind going for church, I thought, man, can you imagine the sweat drops he shed for me? Can you imagine that? I mean, when I feel that humidity, I think of him and that in the garden praying. So what was he praying about? <clears throat> Giving his life for me. 
And do you remember his word? <coughs> Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, but not my will, yours be done. I mean, thank God it was his will that Jesus come to this earth and die for me. Thank God that Jesus was willing to go through with it. He didn't take his own plan. He said, but Father, your will be done. And because of his will, today I can stand here and say, I'm his. Because of that act that Jesus did on the cross, not only can I say I'm his, but I can be sin free. How long? Well, it depends on me, doesn't it? It depends on me and, and what I choose and how I act and the things that I do. But I can go to the Lord and I can ask for forgiveness and I can be sin free. Why? Because of that touch of Jesus upon me. Because of, look at that picture. Because of his willingness to be sacrificed for me. And, and so we go look at the leper here. He was willing to be touched and was God willing? Yes. I mean, we can go through the Bible and there are so many different stories that, that we can see about touching. First, you have to understand this. The touch that Jesus gave that leper was an intimate touch. It was a touch meant for him. The conversation was had, will you touch me? Yes. And then Jesus reached out. Yep. It was for him. It was a personal touch that Jesus decided to give an intimate touch to say, okay, here. And what he said in that touch was, because of your faith, because you believe that I can, I will. It, it takes that faith to believe. This man, when he came to him, he knew Jesus could. How many of you have a sin? All of us. How many of you have a sin that you struggle with over and over and over? Probably all of us. I can't, but he can. It takes a conversation. Jesus, are you willing to take this burden, this sin of mine, away? And I can tell you his answer. I am willing. The unread thing in this scripture is, are you willing to give it up? It's one thing to ask. It's one thing to believe, but are you willing to get rid of it? Are you willing to, for God to take it from you? See, and I say that because how many times have you given God that sin and taken it back? <coughs> How many times have you gone from a situation and put yourself right back in that situation? When we say an, an alcoholic doesn't meet his friends at a bar. He doesn't. Not unless he is super strong or willing to pick it back up. So look at your life. God is willing to give you that intimate touch. Are you willing to accept it? God's touch is powerful. Man, look throughout Scripture at God's touch. He totally changed people's lives. I mean, one, one that we can really look at. I mean, that I really... Saul to Paul. I remember being a kid and I said, he just changed one letter. How big a change was that? I, I could go from S to P. You know? I mean, I was a young kid. I thought, that doesn't... He really didn't change him. But when you study it, who was Saul? Saul was a persecutor of the church. Not only was he the persecutor of the church, he was the best. Saul's name brought fear. Saul came to town and you were a church person fear. Because he didn't just persecute the church. He killed the Christians. 
He would slay you. I mean, if Saul walked in this door today, his job would be to take you all out. But then on a road, Damascus, he saw a light. He, he, he was chased. Now, I don't know that it happened that fast for me. Gosh, I was in church for two years. I was in youth groups for a year. I was learning all this stuff, and finally it was like, well, yeah. Maybe I should make a change. Saul is walking down the road, going about his job, sees a bright light, is blinded. Three days later, the blindness comes away, and he is not Saul anymore. He is now Paul. Why? The powerful touch of Jesus. Powerful touch of Jesus. Totally changed that man. I mean, he went from persecuting the church and killing Christians to preaching and creating Christians. Was it easy? No. Can you imagine the first time you saw Saul last week kill that guy over there? And then the next Sunday he's walking into church saying, hey, I want to give the message. Well, I'm out the back door. Yeah. What did it take? What did it take for Paul to be able to give his message? Jesus' touch and the touch of Barnabas. Who was it that went before him and said, hey, it's okay, he he's changed. It, there was a witness. There was a personal witness that said, hey, it, it's okay. We can allow this message to be given. It, was, it wasn't easy for the people to sit there probably and have that guy standing up front. I know what that feels like. All I have to do, if I want that feeling, I just have to go home to my home church. And get up on that pulpit. And there are people there that go, Him? I mean, do you remember Worm? You've been here long enough, you know that was my nickname that some had for me. My sister started it, love her to death. What a nickname, Worm. And it was for a reason. And the people, the people of the church knew the stories of the mailman. They knew that story. They, they knew, they knew Tracy. Now, when I was young, I said, "Saul and Paul, if anybody could do that, I'm Tracy to Tracy." Get what I mean? I was Tracy Worm, uh, this person. And now I'm Tracy. A totally different person than that person, yet the same name. And so when they hear the name, they're all like, oh. oh. Yeah, I remember him in youth groups. Probably. I remember what you... Yeah, that was me. But I'm different. What made the difference? Right. That powerful touch of Jesus. That ability to change a person, to give them new life, to, to allow them to uh, redo. I mean, I mentioned a few weeks back, I mean, what, what day do you celebrate? Your birthday? Or I have some friends that celebrate their rebirth day. So do I celebrate May 6, 1961, or do I celebrate... April 11th. Got to figure the year. That would be uh, 1975. Well, which one do I celebrate? Do I celebrate the old Tracy or do I celebrate the new? Do I celebrate who I was or do I celebrate who I am now because of the touch? Because in all significance, I should celebrate the April date. 
Because that's when I was made me. That's when I was made complete in him because of the touch. I mean, we got Simon who became Peter. We got Jacob the trickster who became Israel. We got Abram who became Abraham. We have just a, a ton of people in the Bible that were changed like that because of the touch. I mean, I guarantee you something. I'm going to guarantee you this. If you're sitting here today and you count yourself a Christian, you're changed because of the touch. So this morning I walked out the door and I remember his anguish in the garden and everything because of that humidity, because of that dampness, because of that. I remember the joy. Same time I remember the joy because that sun beat on my face. And I could feel the warmth and the care and the love of God. I felt the breeze that came through the trees that that, that kind of take you away, kind of. I have a couple big owls in the house, and this morning they've been gone. And this morning one of the owls started hooting. I mean, he's, he's back. It's there. It reminds me of God's creation and everything that's there. I mean, every day there's things around me that remind me of his touch and what he wants for us and how he takes care of us. I mean, it's there every day. Do you forget it? Do you gloss it over and pass it on because you're so busy and this and that? Do you realize that touch is constantly upon you as he changes you day by day, hour by hour? I mean, it makes you different. It's a transforming touch. Now, I told you it transformed me. It, 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 it changed my life. I was not Saul to Paul. I mean, I tell you a story all the time. I, I walked the aisle on an Easter Sunday and accepted God as my Lord and Savior. And on Monday, back at school, one of the kids said, Hey, I heard that you did this yesterday. And I was like, Yeah, well. You know, some of my other family was doing it, so I went up with them. It was, it was no biggie. I mean, I played it off. Because I was afraid what they might say or think or do. And today I think about it and say, Man, how dumb was I? There was a prime possibility right there in front of me the day after I accepted Christ to witness to others. And I, I didn't become this Tracy for another couple of years. Well, I was different. I mean, got more involved in church and things and people knew and we came to the point we weren't really ashamed that we did that and different things. But it took time. I mean, this Tracy you see today took years of molding and, and caressing and, and it's it's by that touch that transforms. Now you go to scripture and you can understand the transforming because he's the potter and we're the clay. Anyone ever watch BJ and Dirty Dragon? Maybe that was a Chicago show. They had this guy that was on there every every week he had this blob of clay. And every week he would mold it into something. And it might be a fire hydrant, it might be a dog, it might be and and Blah always talked like this. And when he was molding, he'd be like, because it tickled those Chicago. But he would get it all put together, and there was always a lesson behind what he was making that clay into be. And I remember the one time he, he made it into a cross. And Blah went, and he says, well, I paid you after Christ. <coughs> Well, because we need that in our lives to be different. And he would tell the story through that thing like that. And I, I just remember that blob being made in a Christ and that blob of clay where he said the verse, he is the potter, you are the clay. And then it came to me, and I'm being molded every day. I'm being tucked in and pushed here and pulled here and Slowly, day by day, as I allow, God makes a difference in me so that I can make a difference in others. And I just thank God every day that He's not done molding me yet. And it comes back to this story here where the guy asked, Are you willing? God says, Yes. And I said to the point, But are you willing? And the point of this whole sermon about touching is this. Are you willing?
to allow God to touch you, to mold you, to change you, so you can be what He would have you to be and not what you think you are. Amen. So that you can make a difference in this world that has to be instead of what you think it should be. Amen. You see, because look at the world out there. It's a mess. There are a lot of blobs of clay that were plopped down to be molded for Christ that are still just a blob of clay. It's sad to say this, but there's probably some blobs of clay in here that have been plopped down that are his, that said, I, I claimed him, that you never allowed him to mold you. You've never allowed him to change you. Oh, you've accepted him. And you claim the name of Christ. <coughs> That's all the part that you've got. His touch goes far deeper than that. His touch is a transforming touch. Transforming means totally changing your life. You know, we have to transform our movies out today, and this Camaro becomes this big, this big robot thing that can. That's transformed. That, that's being something totally different than what you were. And you know, I mean, I, I can stand here right now and I can tell you what I was. I know what, what I was. I know those early years of Tracy. I know where I am now, and I know the later years, and I know that he's making a difference. Because I'm allowing him to touch me. I'm allowing him to change me instead of me trying to change him. I'm allowing him to be God and me to be servant. What about you? You see, just as me, Jay, took that blob of clay and molded it into that cross, God wants to mold you into what he thinks you and knows you ought to be. You're in this place for a reason, for purpose, to hear that God wants to change you today. God wants to mold you so that you can make a difference in this world. I mean, He wants to mold you. And you got the tough two last hours of class, right? And, and those kids that don't want to be there. But He's going to mold you to make a difference in their lives. And my wife told the story this morning about a kid that came into a room. I mean, school's just started and they're already coming in. And, and he's like, you know, there's some things with my mom and, and this is going on. And Dawn's like, well, I'm going to go over here in the corner and say a prayer for your mom. And the kid's like, what? I'm going to go over here and say a prayer for your mom. And then Dawn went to the corner and did a prayer for her mom. I mean, public school. And, and I don't know who asked the question, but someone said in Sunday school lesson, do you ever get in trouble for that from the school or the school board? I mean, it's frowned upon, but what was your rule? What happens in my room stays in my room. What happens in my room stays in my room. And she tells the kids that what happens in here stays in here. Here's what happens what goes on. And that kid was so grateful that here was a teacher who was willing to have a prayer for his mom and was excited about changing lives. Changing lives, touching, touching that life for that mere 30 seconds or minute that she prayed, I mean, meant the world for that person. And that's what God has in store for every one of us. I mean, I can go around this room and tell you stories that you have told me about situations you're in. I mean, it's about God molding you. Isn't that what you said on the phone, Deb? God's going to use you? In this instance, to make a difference in people's lives? I mean, she believes that. I mean, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. But she believes she's in that condition because she's going to make a difference in maybe her kids' lives or other family members or friends around her or something because of it. She doesn't look at it as a burden, kind of as a blessing that now I get a chance to touch these people with where I'm at. I mean, there are stories like this all across this room, and you're making a difference because you're allowing God to take that blob of clay and mold it into something 
Don't stop. Don't stop allowing. And he still has work to do and you still have changes to be done so that you can be better and more out there. And that's what it's all about. And if you're a blob of clay that you haven't allowed him to change you yet, this week, talk to him. Have the conversation. Lord, I know you can. I'm willing. Are you willing? And his answer, you know what his answer is. Yes. Oh yeah, I'm willing. I showed a video once with the uh, skip guys that, that they're doing it. And, and the guy's like this, and the guy takes a chisel, and remember the chisel, and he goes, cheek, 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 starts beating on the guy, and the guy's like, oh, 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 what are you doing? Well, you don't need that anymore. Realize this. There are parts of your life you don't need anymore. It's those parts that are holding you back from being what God wants you to be, and you've got to change. And God knows what those parts are. Let them work. Let them mold. Let them change you. Let Him transform you into what you ought to be. <clears throat> Will you allow Jesus to touch you today? Amen. Will you allow Him to touch you tomorrow? Will you allow Him to touch you every day to make you the best you that you could ever be? And I'll guarantee you this. You don't know who that person is yet. But you look in the mirror each day and it's like, oh. As you allow him to change you, you'll see the differences and those differences will be seen by others in you. And our goal is to be like Christ. Our goal is to allow God to mold and make that clay until we look like Jesus. Amen. Until we act like Jesus. Until we act like the heirs to the throne that we are. We're going to offer him of invitation. It's an opportunity for you to look at your blob of play. It's an opportunity for you to search your heart and look and do I want what he's telling me about? Do I want God in my life molding my clay? Because I can look back and I, I can look at my clay prior to God and I was molding myself and it wasn't pretty. But He's doing a great job to this point so far. And I trust He's going to do far more in the days to come. So if you're sitting here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, maybe it's time to turn your clay over. To quit trying to mold it yourself and allow Him to mold you. To make you what He'd have you be. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're that blob of clay that you've accepted, you did everything, you started molding it, and you did, you're doing your own thing. And let Him touch you again. Maybe you're here this morning and you're allowing Him to touch you. And I, like I said earlier, don't stop. Don't stop allowing Him to make a difference in your life so that you can then make a difference in this world and other people's lives. Well, whatever your choice, first time ever, or today to get it right again with Him, allow God to touch you as we stand and as we sing. You can make your choice. Come on,